Today's morning coffee vinyl side, Peter Sellers, Songs for Swingin' Sellers, 1959. When George Martin was given control of Parlophone, a record label under the EMI corporate umbrella in 1955, it was floundering in the wake of competition from the big American labels. For years, Parlophone had specialized in classical music and things like original cast recordings of popular musical theater and film productions. It had a firmly established niche. But market trends were shifting, and the label was feeling the squeeze. There were too many players with bigger advantages in those market sectors. Martin recognized the need to steer the label into other, less contended areas of specialty, which he concluded, after some analysis, should be comedy and youth-orientated popular music. Peter Sellers was an up-and-coming comedic talent in the UK, known at the time for his biting dry wit and uncanny ability to mimic accents, mannerisms, modalities of speech. He could conjure and create characters at will. Martin recognized his talent, and on petitioning the bean counters at EMI, was granted the funds to try his hand with Sellers, but only to the tune of a 10-inch EP. The project, titled The Best of Peter Sellers, released in 1958, was a smashing success, and Martin and Sellers were given the green light for a follow-up, Sellers' first full-length LP. Songs for Swingin' Sellers is a parody and satire with deep cultural references that would have been known to listeners of the day. There were some broad strokes. The opening song, like the title, is a wink to Frank Sinatra and his album Songs for Swingin' Lovers, but also some penetrating social satire that took aim at some very specific people and known events on which Sellers affixed his gaze. The album has music and skits where Sellers displays his absolute mastery of dialect and form, creating believable and distinct characters engaged in interplay and conversation, delivering some of the best and most targeted satire ever put to wax. And George Martin's production and sound design are also masterful, using sound effects and creating physical spaces for characters to inhabit. Not only did it serve as a learning lab in production for Martin, it was his first stereo mix, but it also empowered him within EMI. The album, of course, was another smashing success. The album's influence was undeniably huge. It changed the comedic landscape in the UK, its influence even reaching across the Atlantic. Without it, you wouldn't have had Monty Python you might not even have had National Lampoon. Such was its reach. Of course, it was star-making for Peter Sellers, who went on to fame and fortune in film as a beloved character actor and star in his own right. But it opened the doors wide for Martin, too. Martin continued with more comedy and started signing youth acts, hitting some success with Adam Faith. And the money generated from comedy helped fund further explorations and acquisitions until 1962, when George signed a band of four lads from Liverpool to a recording contract. You might have heard of them. There's a direct link between some of the sound design and recording techniques Martin developed for Songs for Swing and Sellers and those used in recording later Beatles works, most notably Sgt. Pepper. George wasn't particularly loved at EMI. Parlophone was meant to be more of a pasture for him than a main stage. But Martin was too ambitious and arguably smart to allow his isolation to stall out his career. It was both his genius and, of course, Sellers that changed the label's trajectory. And I think it's absolutely fascinating to consider that without this album, there'd have been no Beatles. Can you imagine undoing and reimagining the last 60 years of popular music?